I'm not somebody who waits for permission and I like to go ahead and do things. And I never don't like to miss out on anything from want of asking for it, you know? Like there's an expression I picked up in Brazil, which is you already have the no. And I kind of like live or die by that expression now. Like you might as well ask, you already have the no. So like, who knows, you might get a yes. That was a clip from today's guest, Nell McShane Wolfhart. Nell is a journalist, decision coach, and the author of The Great Stewardess Rebellion, How Women Launched a Workplace Revolution at 30,000 Feet. Nell's career is defined by her quick and good decision making. Her experience as a freelance journalist refined her ability to spot a good idea and gave her the resilience to go after it, even in the face of rejection. This is such a cool conversation. Uh, Nell is just a very, very unique and interesting person and her thoughts on this topic of decision making and kind of taking a risk and starting something new and really in, in a way starting her own industry it's really compelling and i think there's a lot of great stuff for everyone who's going to listen but before we get to that please rate review and subscribe to the podcast my name is aram arslanian and this is one step beyond Welcome back to the show. Uh, today's guest is someone who's got a really, really interesting background. I'm really excited to have on. So welcome to the show. Thanks so much for having me. Happy to be here. Awesome. So for the uninitiated, for people who don't know, who are you and what do you do? Um, my name is Nell McShane Wolfhart. I have, I guess, what some people would call a portfolio career. Um, I was a freelance travel writer for many years, maybe like 15 years. And then I recently wrote a book, a nonfiction book about stewardesses in the 1960s and 70s. And that came out in April. And I have another business that I run on the side, which uh, in which I make decisions for people. Um, I'm a decision coach. And they call me when they have a big decision to make in their lives, and I tell them what to do. Heck yeah, that is awesome. All right, so where do you want to start? Um, wherever you want. I'm, I'm, I'm open. Okay. I, I want to hear about it all, but I want to start with the book, because the book is, all of it's compelling, but the book is like such an incredible topic and an incredible story. So let's start with the book. What can you tell us, tell us about it? Sure. It's called The Great Stewardess Rebellion. And it's a true story. Um, I, it's about a group of stewardesses in the United States who in the 1960s and 70s turned America's most sexist workplace, the airplane cabin, into a place where they could be treated as workers, winning rights as women who are workers. And in the process, they made changes for American working women along the way. It's a story about the labor movement. It's a story about the women's movement. And it's a story about some very, very interesting and unusual stewardesses. Amazing. So how did you even get interested or even become aware of this as a topic? Um, I used to have what I consider my best job ever, which was a travel column in the New York Times travel section in which I interviewed celebrities about what they took in their carry-on luggage. So this was like the easiest gig I've ever had. Just call up RuPaul, be like, what do you pack in your luggage? Tell me everything, the weird stuff, transcribe it, send it off. Best job ever. And somebody I interviewed was Adam Conover, who is a podcast host and had a TV show at the time in which he did sort of a, a myth busting. You know, he took a myth busting approach. And he was telling me about an episode that he'd done on the golden age of travel which is something that when we think about that, we think about Mad Men, we think about Don Draper in first class, we think about beautiful slim flight attendants and cocktails and, you know, roast beef being sliced in front of you, like truly this like glamorous level of travel. And his episode had talked about how it really was like that for the passengers, but for the women working on the plane, it was this incredibly sexist environment in which you were fired if you got married, you were fired if you got pregnant, you were fired when you turned 32, um, and you had to adhere to incredibly strict appearance standards, things like if you gained a few pounds, you might be pulled off a flight and lose your job. 
So he was just telling me about this episode he'd done, um, kind of exposing the seamy underbelly of the golden age of travel. And I, I said to him, that sounds like it would make a great book. And then I just sort of ran off and wrote it. <laughs> uh, so first of all, how long did it take you to write the book? Um, that's always a difficult question because if you, when you're writing nonfiction, you generally have to spend months writing a proposal and then you sell a proposal. So I think I spent about six months, um, working on the proposal with the help of my agent and in doing loads of interviews and sort of pulling together the threads of the story. Um, and then maybe a year and a half of research and more interviews and actual writing of the book. So maybe all in all two years. It's just such a wild thing because previous to this, had you ever written a book before? I had written an audio book. Um, mm -hmm. I had done a book for Audible, an Audible original, it's called, which I think was around 60,000 words. So maybe, you know, half to two thirds of the length of what we think of as a typical, you know, paper book. Um, but that was audio only. There was no print version. And it was more like writing a series of long articles than it was writing like one long narrative. So this felt very, very different to me. And had you aspired in your your career or just in your life in general to be an author for someone who had to actually write books before? I think every journalist aspires to be an author, if only for the fact that you can stop working on 50 things at once and just work on one <laughs> thing at once. <laughs> I feel like we're all out there looking for a book idea that we can just like sell and get a decent advance and just like stop hustling for one second. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, I've always dreamed of writing a book. I think maybe a lot of people feel that way, but for sure, that was, that was a dream of mine. Well, I think it's like, you totally hit on something where yeah, I think like a lot of people dream of like writing a book or making a movie or doing these things. And then you find yourself in a field where it's like, well, of course, you're a journalist, you're writing, but you're navigating like that constant hustle of getting gigs and churning these things out. How do you find that I, that idea and then the moment in time where you can build around that idea? So from the moment where you're like, oh, someone should write a book on that to actually saying oh, I'm actually going to do that. Was it instant or did you have to think about it? Did you talk about it? Like, what was that process from getting the idea to saying, I'm going to try it? Oh, I, I took action on that right away. Um, as if we start talking about my decision-making business, we can get into this further. But I truly think the key to any success that I've had um, is not that I'm like, the world's most wonderful writer, but I make very quick decisions and I take action on them right away. So if I hear like a great idea for a book, I'm going to sit down, start researching, thinking about a proposal, emailing people who might be interested. And this applies to like any idea in any part of my life. Um, yeah. I feel like in general, success comes more from taking action quickly than it does from like sitting around and thinking and considering. Um, and of course, you know, some of the time you take action on ideas and they don't pan out or totally. you move too fast, but I would say 90% of the time you're better off just like moving on it right away. So when I got this idea, I talked to my agent, I did a bunch of research. I made tons of phone calls. I could see that there was a story here. Like, and the story is also, it's very dramatic. Like it's told through, you know, individuals, people's stories, the stories of three particular women. And like there are ups and downs and twists and turns. So I, I knew this was this was something that was like a great fit and was going to make a really great book. And so, yeah, I didn't I didn't waste any more time deliberating. <laughs> oh, yeah. So when you started writing and or let's say researching, were people excited to talk about it or were they reticent to, to talk about it? Or was it just like hard to even find people to talk about it? No, people were interested in talking about it. Um, I think there's a certain obscurity in which women languish, especially, you know, women who are, you know, taking the most action and doing the most um, exciting things of their lives in like the 20th century, you know, in the 60s or the 70s. Like history just doesn't pay that much attention to them. And so when finally somebody comes along and is like, I think your story is amazing and here's an untold part of American history that I want to tell, you know, there's some sense of validation or justification or even, you know, one thing that was very common with the women I interviewed for this book is they wanted to to share the story of the women's movement that they felt like a lot of, you know, younger women these days didn't really know. They didn't know that in the seventies you couldn't get a credit card in your own name, that sort of thing. Um, and so it was an opportunity to, to tell these stories and to, and to, and to sort of record them in a way that like, you know, 10 or 20 years from now, they're, they're not going to be around to, to tell them. 
Yeah, it's so amazing that you you found this idea and you acted on this idea in time because like that is definitely a closing window and then that story is just lost otherwise. Exactly. Um, I mean, they're all in great health, you know, you know, but they're all over 70 and some of them are over 90. <laughs> um, so yeah, it was like, it was, it was sort of a now or never moment. But also it seemed to me that in the past few years, the labor movement, at least in the United States, is undergoing like really a renaissance and there's a lot of exciting stuff happening. Um, and so it was a good sort of good timing as well, you know, um, when we're watching things like Amazon warehouses unionizing and Starbucks unionizing. Like here was a story about stewardesses unionizing um, back in the 60s and 70s that I feel like had a lot of resonance. Yeah. So what could you share about the story of the book uh, that's told in the book without like giving away all the goods so we make sure that people are interested in, in checking it out? Um, yeah, well, I think first and foremost, it's a story about people. It's a story about um, two women in particular, a woman named Pat and a woman named Tommy, and their sort of um, evolution from, you know, women who thought they would become a stewardess for a few years and then move on to doing something else to becoming lifelong flight attendants, union activists, and militant union leaders, um, women who were like swept along by the labor movement and the women's movement and inspired by those movements to take like real big, powerful action in their lives and in their workplaces. Um, and yeah, like I said, there's a lot of twists and turns along the way and, and quite a lot of drama, but overall it's a story about empowerment and, you know, doing, doing what needs to get done rather than just sort of leaving it for somebody else to do, I guess. Yeah. So, um, in writing this book, and one of the things that I know came up in your pre-interview a lot is that idea of the labor movement going through this this renaissance. So if you can juxtapose the labor movement back in the time in the era of, of when this the story of this of, the, of your book was unfolding and now, what differences are you seeing in the labor movement where we've seen progress, but also what things are just the same? God, honestly, when I look at the labor movement now, all I see is regression. Um, you know, if you think about the labor movement in the 80s and 90s, I, I'm talking about the United States right now. I can't really speak to labor movements outside the United States. But like there was a huge drop in union membership. There was sort of a turning of the media on labor unions and, you know, uh, the way they were perceived and the way they were they were written about um, and there, I can just see the. I see so much loss in the last in the last couple of decades of the twentieth century, while at the time of the book in the sixties and seventies, like unions were were much more common. More people belonged to unions. Um, almost all flight attendants were organized in unions. And the fact that the the main struggle in the book is not with the idea of unionizing. It's about the power struggle within the unions and who gets to be in charge and who gets to lead. I think that's super interesting. Well, right now, if we're looking at sort of the labor changes that are happening in the United States at the moment, like it's small, it's scrappy. I feel like there's a real movement away from what I would call big labor and big labor organizations. There's so much more independent you know, unions that are forming. Um, which again, that's something that happens in the book at the end of the book. Like there's a decision to turn away from big labor and into an independent union led by women. Um, so I feel like there's lessons people could probably learn from that. Well, could you tell us about the difference? And what you just said is actually the first time I've ever heard that. Um, so it, earlier in my life, uh, I worked as a therapist in uh, addiction and mental health. And I'm, I was very fortunate that of my first three professional jobs I ever had, two were in union settings. And when I went into my fourth job, which was outside of therapy, it was the first like totally non-union setting I had in it. It was the first time I worked in it in something that wasn't a not-for-profit. And I was like, absolutely like blown away. I was like, oh, this is how people treat each other. It's terrible. And I got used to that um, boiler room, kind of like the, just the intensity of working in a non-union union setting. But also something I realized as I, as I got along, I was like, wow, this is changing the way I look at people and it's changing the way that I look at labor and that I look at people's rights. And I had to really recenter myself when I started my own company about like, what are the values that I came up with coming into not-for-profit and structured a for-profit business more aligned to those values. But it was really because I've, I've worked in both and had 
bad experiences of both, but primarily from like a worker's perspective, always felt supported by a union. So when I hear this thing, like kind of like big union versus small union, or kind of like more, I guess what you say, like almost like a mainstream union versus an independent union, I actually haven't heard that, that language before. So could you tell us a bit more about that difference between the two? Uh, sure. But I do have a question for you, which is, yeah. are your employees unionized? They are not, a, they're not unionized. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. I'm just curious. <laughs> yeah. and, I mean, it's like, I, as you're saying that I was like, do I want, like, is that, is that something that that would be good for the company? And I, I don't have an opinion about it. I'm like, I don't know. I've never really thought about it before until right now. Right. Totally. I mean, that, that makes perfect sense to me, especially for a small company. Um, yeah, well, I feel like there's there's sort of big labor, like the Transport Workers Union or the Teamsters, which is the one everyone has heard of. Or, you know, and then there's federations of labor, like the AFL-CIO. So it, I have to say, it's quite complicated, and there are so many acronyms. <laughs> I feel like once I started learning more about the labor movement, it was all acronyms, like constantly, all the time. Um, but I would say that, like, there are... There are lots of small unions that are affiliated to bigger unions, um, and you know the reason for that is obviously power in numbers. You know, when you're part of a much bigger union organization, you know, there everyone who you know everyone will go on strike if you go on strike. People will back you up when you're trying to to get a raise in your wages. Like there is certainly a lot more uh, power behind you. But when you're in a small independent union, like you get to run things, you're not being represented by somebody who who works for the big union. You're making more of the decisions. It's just two different approaches. Um, and, you know, like I said, a lot of times those small unions will be affiliated to a bigger union or if you're part of a bigger union, you might not feel the need to affiliate. It's it's complicated and I would say also slightly boring <laughs> to get into. But I think that um, in general, yeah, that would be the main distinction, that there's more power in numbers when you're affiliated to a big union, to a more established traditional union, and there's more freedom and decision making that you can do when you're in a smaller union. So from your perspective, and, you know, I, I'm, I'm just totally asking for your opinion on this. We, you mentioned the shift from uh, earlier times where there's really like pro-union sentiment, people believed in unions, wanted unions, into the 80s and 90s where there was a big, big dip in that. But it is now the labor movement's having a renaissance again. So what do you think led to that big dip? Was it a concerted effort from like companies to kind of like take away that shine? Was it just essentially like marketing to get unions to have less power? Ronald Reagan. <laughs> I mean, there's sort of almost a cliche in like leftist circles or leftist Twitter that you can pin every bad thing that's happened in the United States in the last 40 years on Ronald Reagan. <laughs> right. But it's also not untrue. Um, but I would say that that was like a big, a big part of it. He was somebody who hated workers, who hated poor people, you know, did a lot of union busting and was on the side of, you know, capitalism and big companies versus, you know, um, the workers. And it's an easy answer, but I also don't think it's incorrect. Yeah. So like, would you say that like, and again, just asking for, from an opinion point of view, like, would you say that's kind of like a, a clear starting point or maybe an acceleration point? And then it was taken, taken there by other people. Yeah. Like I other think Reagan, forces? Reagan was maybe an acceleration point. I think there was a decline in union density before he was elected, um, for various reasons, um, political reasons. And I think that there has continued to be a decline, but like the, the decline that happened in the Reagan years was, was enormous. And like the labor movement is still trying to build back up to the kind of density that it had 50 years ago. Um, you know, and so that's like a, a fight. People are still, people are still fighting. It's, um, it's been a downward trajectory for a long time, but there have been a lot of surveys recently that say that, Popularity, union popularity is higher than it's been before, that more people are pro-labor movement than they've been in a long time. And so there, there are some very encouraging signs. Okay. I, I, it's, you know, for someone who's been part of unions, I've really never spent any time like really like learning or thinking about unions outside of the fact like, oh, I'm, I'm in a union or wow, I'm not in a union and what a freaking nightmare <laughs> that is to not be in a union. Um, so around the book, I know part of it is like, wow, this is a cool topic. I want to tell the story. Is there anything that you hope that the book accomplishes outside of telling the story? Uh, I hope somebody turns it into a movie and gives me lots of money. <laughs> Respect. <laughs> I, I hope so too. It sounds like a great movie. 
Yeah, I think it would be a great movie too. But um, no, I think that like telling the story and just kind of recording the story, recording the stories of these women and the stories of this like really un, un overlooked and unremarked upon landmark piece of history. Like I feel like I've done that and I'm happy with that. And uh, most importantly to me is that the the women whose story I tell in the book think I did a good job with it. Like I was, oh, yeah. you know, when I sent them the book to read, I was pretty much hiding under the covers until they until they'd read it and got back to me with their comments. But they think that I told a told the story well with respect and and honestly. So for me, that that was enough. Awesome. And I mean, that's huge, because if we talk about like reception, if the subject matter, like the people who you're writing about, they're approving of it. I mean, what more could you want outside of getting a movie and selling tons of books, which, of course, anyone would want. That's, yeah. that's amazing. <laughs> so as a as a writer and a journalist and someone who wanted to write a book, but hadn't necessarily been like, I shall write a book one day, you know, it just kind of been in the lexicon of things you'd want to do. What's that like now that you've written a book? What has that opened up for you in your thinking? Oh, that's a great question. Um, I definitely, after I wrote it and like filed all my edits and it was coming out, I basically sat and stared at the wall for maybe like four months. <laughs> As one does. Uh, yeah. Like I, I, I was basically figuring out what to do next. It's like, okay, I've, I've done this thing that I always wanted to do. It got great reviews. People like the book. Like I, I was thrilled with, with how it was received. And then it was like, Oh, right. But what do I, what do I do now? Um, so I'm still, I'm like working on a bunch of different projects and thinking about that, but I, I loved learning about the process of writing a book and about the process of publishing a book, which is a totally different thing. And just like getting a peek into that world. Um, I like to do a lot of things at once and I like to do new things all the time. And just to like go through the process from like idea to publishing book to promoting book um, was just such an interesting thing to learn about. Um, and I think I, I don't know if it has changed too much about my general approach to life, except that I am like militantly pro-union in a way that I might not have been before, <laughs> as, you, as you can probably tell. I didn't get that at all. <laughs> right. So like from a creative standpoint, because, you know, a lot of this, pod, this pod, podcast is about business and leadership. And one of the things I think about leadership is just the willingness to do something and not look for permission from, from people. So for example, like write a book, you know, like you said earlier, a lot of people want to write a book. Like I, you know, I want to write a book. Most people want to write a book, but very few people write a book. And of those people who write books, very few people write a successful book, one that's well received, that the, that the subject matter who has been written on, they approve of it. It's like, it's a pretty rare thing. So I know that there can be that desire once someone's been successful at something to like, Oh, well, I've got to keep this going now. I got to hop on the next thing. I got to do the next thing. So in that space, is it okay for someone just to like write one great book and to be like, I'm done. I hope so. <laughs> so one of the things that uh, I like to ask people about is around just doing something and not asking permission. You know, the, this podcast is about business and it is about leadership. And when I think about leadership, it's that daringness just to do something that someone wants to do. And a lot of people want to write a book like you talked about earlier. And of the people who want to write books, very few of them do. And of those who do write a book, very few are successful books. And a book, if we say successful, I mean, success could be selling a ton of copies or success could be becoming a movie, or it could just be the audience of uh, the subject matter who the book is written about is approving of it, um, whatever success may mean. But you've had a book that was well received, that did well, that was reviewed well, the audience really liked it. So, and you just took a leap and did it, which I love. Now, of course you have a background as, as a journalist anyways, but I just love that you did it. But now that you've done it and you've tasted that success, I could, you know, I could imagine there might be a little bit of a desire of like, what's the next thing? How do I keep the momentum going? Where do I go? So with that in mind, is it okay for someone just to like drop a solid, like a killer record or a killer book or a killer movie and be like, I'm done. I'm off to next things. Well, first of all, I love the idea of just doing like one thing really well and then moving on to the next thing. Like, I think a lot of people have the kind of brains where, you know, they get bored with things and they like to do new things. And so like, right, do one thing, work on it really hard for a few years, then move on to a totally different thing, which maybe is something I, I'm doing now. But it's so interesting how you said about 
you know, asking for permission because I feel like writing a book, you need so many people's permission to like write a book and to publish a book. Like, I mean, you can self publish, of course, always, but like you need your agent to give you the go ahead and to work on it. You need somebody willing to buy it. You need people willing to market it. Like you need permission from so many people along the way to publish a book in the traditional sense. And in like, at like a big five publishing house that I don't think of it as, um, a particularly adventure, adventurous sort of thing to do. I think of it as something with like so many gatekeepers and, you know, so many obstacles you have to knock down along the way. But I, I totally agree that in general, like I'm not somebody who waits for permission and I like to go ahead and do things and I never don't like to miss out on anything from want of asking for it, you know, like there's an expression I picked up in Brazil, which is you already have the no. And I kind of like live or die by that expression now. Like you might as well ask, you already have the no. So like, who knows? You might get a yes. Hell yeah. I, I think that's amazing. Okay. Before we go on to the next topic where I want to talk about your, your work as a decision coach, where can people find the book? Where can they look that up? Where can they get it? Anything you want to share about around the book, including the title? Sure. It's called The Great Stewardess Rebellion, and you can get it wherever you buy books. There's an audio version, a really fantastic uh, audiobook narrator, you know, Kindle version, paper paper version. It'll be in paperback starting in February. Um, yeah, wherever you buy books, you can find The Great Stewardess Rebellion. Heck yeah. And what we'll do is we'll make sure that everything's linked up uh, in, our, in our episode description as well so that people will just have quick links to it. All right. So let's talk about decision coaching. So I like when I heard this, there, there's something I get all the time. So I, like I told you, I came up as a therapist. I also grew up playing in like punk, punk and hardcore bands. And I've been, I've done that since I was like a little kid. And so I have a ton of people that I know from the therapy world. And I have a ton of people I know through like just playing music and both audiences, including just normal other people that I know in life are always like, what the hell do you do? Like nobody understands <laughs> what executive coaching is or communication coaching. Uh -huh. And I always have people who are like, oh, are you like one of those like inspirational speakers like that has infomercials? And it's like they go to like the lowest rung of possibility of what I could be. I'm like, okay, I, whatever, whatever works. So when I heard decision coach, I instantly did the exact same thing. I was like, what, what is that? And then as I was talking to Mike and Monica, I was like, oh, this is actually like super cool. But tell us about what it is and how you even found this or created this for yourself. Sure. Um, well, it is a job that I made up entirely, totally invented. Um, basically, I only do one thing, which is that people call me when they're trying to make a big decision and they're, they're stuck, uh, and I tell them what to do. Um, that's literally it. I don't offer packages. I don't offer months long coaching programs. I only sell one thing, which is one session takes around an hour. We make one big decision. Then they go off and move on with their lives. Like the web, my website is called decide and move forward because that's literally what I help them do. We decide and then they move forward with their lives. Um, and I got into it basically, I've, <laughs> I guess I've always been the person that my friends and family came to when they need just like straightforward perspective on something like direct, no waffling kind of response. Tell me what to do. Help me figure things out. And I'm a fixer. If somebody comes to me with any kind of situation or problem, like my brain automatically goes to work trying to, to figure out like what they should do. Um, and then I, I think somebody, <laughs> it's quite possible it was somebody who was getting some unasked for advice who was like, why don't you go see if people want to pay you to do this for them? And I thought, okay, why not? Um, which is my approach to many things in life. And yeah, I put up a website and I've been doing it for almost 10 years now. And it turns out that people really struggle with decision-making, that it is so hard to make decisions, um, especially decisions that feel really big. And I would actually say that you would think most of my clients would be the chronically indecisive, like the people who can't figure out what to eat for dinner. But I would say it's mostly people who in general are, are pretty decisive, even like type A style personalities. And for whatever reason or other, there's one decision they've come up against and they just, they can't figure it out. So they call me, I get them unstuck and then they go off and live their lives. Yeah. So like to ask you kind of like the foundational questions, do you help people make the decisions? Like they make the decisions or do you make it for them and then they just go with what you want? Or is it some, is it kind of like wherever it lands with each person? 
That that's a good question because I I tell I mean I tell them my opinion. I make a strong recommendation as to like here's what you should do. But I will say that many people when they come to me, they don't know what they want to do, but like somewhere inside them they do know. So yeah. my job is to just pull that out of them. Like I have a couple exercises I ask them to do. I ask a lot of questions. And it's like a 360 degree view of their life, right? If they're making a decision about changing jobs or something, like I want to know about their hobbies and their pets and their partner and their finances, because any big decision affects every facet of your life. Um, and then my job is basically to like figure out the thing that is inside them, the thing that they, that they want to do, that they want to take action on, but maybe they're afraid, they're not sure it's right. And then to go back to the idea of getting permission, I essentially, I write them a permission slip and tell them it's okay to do this thing. Yeah. Hell yeah. It, well, and to go to the permission thing and, and as I'm going to phrase this, I, I, I don't mean it. I'm asking you this. It's like almost like a, an external audience. Whenever people are in, in the space of speaking on something. So let's say someone's like, Oh, I want to talk about positivity or I'm going to help people make decisions, or I'm going to talk about leadership. The first question that I think a lot of people are like, well, who the hell are you to do that? Right? And it's like, as an example, if I was going to speak on addiction or mental health, well, it's like, I have like backing degrees, you know, I went to school for a long time. I have a ton of experience coming, coming my way up the ranks. And even then people would be like, who the hell are you to be talking about all this stuff? It does get to a point though, where it's like, of course, like, Education can be helpful, it can be useful, it can be a legitimizer. But I also know a ton of people who have advanced degrees in psychology who do not know or should not be in any position of helping people with anything like that. So I'm very much pro the idea of like all sorts of people can uh, can have valued and really useful opinions and ideas on things. But the to go to my question is, how much, if any, pushback have you gotten from people being like, well, who the hell are you to get this kind of advice? That's a great question. I actually don't get a lot of pushback on that. And I think it's because I state it straight up on my website and everything I do. Like, I am not a doctor. I am not a therapist. Um, there's no such thing as a professional decision maker. Like, there's no regulation of decision makers or anything like that. Um, I just have been doing this really successfully for almost a decade. And one thing I like to point to is that making good decisions is about creating the life that you want, right? And when I, I have the life that I want, I have like a, a career I'm thrilled with. I've lived all over the world. I have a wonderful partner. I have everything that I want, knock on wood, except my book being turned into a movie. <laughs> but um, like the, and the way that I got there was through good and fast decision making. Um, and so I, my the thing that I love the most about doing it, the thing that actually makes it feel so good and so fulfilling is I can see people who are out there and they're looking at what they want and they're just a little afraid to take the step to get there. And if I just help them do that. And it's like, and the reason I'm qualified to do it is because I know how to do it for myself. I've been doing it for other people for so long, but, and so, and so like, that's why, and I've, yeah, I'm just, <laughs> like I said, I've been doing it for 10 years. Like it's, you know, it's something I'm very practiced at at this stage, but yeah, there's no, certainly no decision makers school licensing or anything like that. It's literally just like a skill that I have was born with and developed over the years. Well, and, but that's the legitimacy side. Like, and as you're telling the story, it's like, well, yeah, but your expertise is like a lifetime of, of doing that and being successful with it. So let's say you were someone who, who didn't have the life that they wanted. It's like, everything's a flaming disaster around you. Then I'd be like, well, well I don't know. But <laughs> that idea that there's not like a governing body or an education in something shouldn't make it uh, a prohibitive of people being in a space where they can help people. And I, I'll give, and, or actually even say if there is, those things don't necessarily legitimize someone helping people. I'll give you an example. Um, so for my world of coaching, there's all of these different uh, like coaching diplomas or certifications you can get. None of that existed like, I don't know, like a decade ago or 15 years ago. It's just, oh, there's an industry. Let's make a certification. And some of them are very valid. They have the best minds in the field come together, create a great curriculum. And some of them are just the most hokey thing. 
And when I interview people to work in the company and they're like, oh, I'm certified by da, da, da. I'm like, okay, cool. So anyways, what's your actual practice? What do you actually do? How did you get to this? Just because someone goes through a certification process, let's say it's a great certification process. Awesome. And, and they did really well in it. It doesn't mean you're a good coach. It just means that you know how to do schoolwork. And Oh, go ahead. I was just going to, I totally agree with you. And the fact that coaching itself is a completely unregulated industry and that right. literally anybody can be like, I'm a coach that, you know, the, I don't expect the average person to be able to differentiate between a good coaching school and a bad one, which effectively like makes putting that you know label or whatever on your website kind of useless, or at least feels almost like fake, you know? Um, so yeah, I'm just, all that is to say, I, I agree with you completely that it's like, it's about experience. It's about, you know, demonstrable success. Um, yeah. And so like, I've written tons of articles on decision-making. I've been on tons of podcasts about decision-making. Like I, you know, I have a lot of stuff that people can look at before they hire me to see like, oh, this is her approach. This is how she gets things done. Like I've got tons of testimonials. Like there is evidence of me being good at it. Um, which I think is worth more than like, um, a stamp from a, a school or a program to which the average person, you know, it means nothing. 100%. So when I got in, like, I, I could not agree with you more. When I got involved in uh, addiction counseling, uh, it was uh, it was kind of like the early 2000s-ish. And so in Vancouver, BC, where I live, it was kind of like the Wild West at that time. Like you could just be like a well-intentioned person who's like, I think doing drugs is bad. And like you could get involved <laughs> and, and pretty quickly get a job. And I don't think that was good or bad. I think a lot of people who probably shouldn't have been in that space got involved. And I think a lot of great people who had a lot to offer got involved. As time went on, and it's totally understandable, you know, government agencies and then, of course, all the places that got funding from the government started to require higher and higher levels of education. And I remember working with someone who had been kind of grandfathered in and who didn't have a, a master's in, in clinical counseling when the rest of us all did. Best therapist I've ever worked with in my entire life. Absolute. I learned so much from this person and they were just amazing. And then our boss at the time, who uh, had a master's degree, was absolutely the most toxic, terrible therapist, terrorized all the staff, horrible to clients. And I remember thinking, like, how can, and they would say it like, oh, so-and-so was grandfathered in as if that was a bad thing. And that idea about, like, degrees and these stamps, these kind of, like, rubber stamps, this person can give you advice or can do this for you, I think it's a really wavery thing in our society where it's like, I, I don't think because someone has an MBA that they're necessarily better uh, at giving advice than this person who just started their own business out of their backyard. Like, I think there's incredible advice. In fact, advice the opposite, yeah. Totally. <laughs> and which is why a lot of I do this podcast is to get these voices. Yeah, I think it's really, I think, I mean, there's a proliferation of coaching right now and of coaches. And yeah, I just think it's really difficult for the average person to know who can help them and who can't because of the fact that it's completely unregulated. Like I, you know, I believe in regulation and certification and those, you know, aspects for, for many things, if only to help the average person figure out if someone is legit or a scam artist. But I totally agree with you that it's like, it's, you know, experience and whether you are good at your job is really the only thing that matters for yeah. sure. So you start this business, something you totally just made up. You're like decision coach. I now do this thing. How did you populate that idea to even get attention? I started off with friends and friends of friends. Um, it turns out when you tell people <laughs> you want to help them make decisions, people start coming to you with all their decisions. Um, like my mother calls me constantly and says, I need the decision coach. <laughs> um, yeah, it just started from there. And then, you know, I was a freelance writer. And so I started pitching articles on decision making and things like that. I had a column at The Muse, which is a career site for a while. Um, you know, I had I have a lot to say about decision making. I absorb a lot of like, you know, research and you know, news and, you know, latest thinking about decision making, although I think a lot of that is kind of useless. Um, and yeah, I, you know, I'm, I'm a hustler. So I'm out there pitching articles and pitching myself for to, on podcasts and, you know, telling people what I do at parties. Uh, I'm, I'm that person. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm, you know, I'm, I'm a self promoter in a way that I hope is not annoying, but in a way that like, you know, I, that I think helps my business. Yeah. And I, I want to, pop into that in a minute but if we if we stick with the decision uh making side of things without revealing too much of your methodology because i i want to respect that if you were to think like the process of someone 
being able to unblock, unstick themselves from decision making. Is there just any kind of like very simple salient points that you can give us about how people can get more comfortable with making big decisions? Oh, sure. And I'm happy to tell you all about my process. Like I am not keeping any secrets here. I write articles about this stuff all the time. There is nothing that like you can only get when you book a session with me, except for, you know, my eyes on your particular decision. Like I am firmly of the belief that sharing what you know is a good marketing technique. And also just, you know, it helps people. I literally got a response yesterday, an email from somebody who had read a newsletter I sent out in the beginning of October, used the advice I gave in the newsletter to buy an apartment help her narrow down the choices to buy an apartment in Melbourne, Australia. And she was just writing to say, thank you. Like she hasn't paid me for a decision. She might never pay me for a decision, but great. I helped her. Like, yeah, so yeah. anyway, all, all that is to say, I, I'm an open book about process and how it works. Um, my main function is, like I said, figuring out what the person wants and alongside that setting up their future self with as many options as possible. And I know that the idea of many options for somebody who is struggling with the decision can often feel overwhelming, but I'm talking about things like making sure our future selves can do what they want to do, like that they are financially secure, that their health is good, that they are living in the place they want to be, that they're in the kind of relationship they want to be in. So I use that for a guide in decision making. I'm very fixated on people making a choice right now where I can draw a straight line from that choice to what they want in the future. I'm not, I don't want like a curvy line, a wiggly line. I want a straight line. I want people to go for the thing that they actually want. And I'm also focused on people making decisions that are in line with their values. And I know when people spend some time in the coaching world, like they could, they could like, it's sort of like the word mindset. Like I could throw myself off a cliff if I never, you know, if I hear the word mindset one more time, but like values are at, like, not religious values, not even moral values, but the things that are important to us in our day-to-day -day lives. Yeah. Like we need to make decisions that are in line with those. Otherwise we're just taking a shortcut to unhappiness. So I yeah. ask people to work on both those things before the call. We go through them. We go through the ins and outs of their options. A lot of time it turns out that the thing they want is actually a third option that they hadn't even considered or they hadn't even thought was possible yet. Um, and I'd like to gently point out that it is possible and here's how you can do it. Um, you know, living in a society where people are like more and more and more living online and putting these kinds of ideas of themselves online. And some people put out kind of very cherry picked versions of themselves online. Some people put out things that are maybe like a little bit too honest and too much for people. Um, do you, do you feel that the amount that we live online now and that we, we show ourselves to other people is helping or hindering or at all affecting the way that people make decisions. That's a really interesting question. I think that people have always been very affected by what other people think. Um, and that's maybe, that's one of the hardest things that I have to help people break through in our sessions is like, oh, I know what I want. I can figure out, like, we figured out what they want, but how are they going to tell these other people? Or people have this sense of misplaced loyalty, like, to the company they work for or something, you know, that, um, that they have to, like, push against. Um, so I think other people's opinions are one of, like, the biggest things standing in between people and the things that they actually want to do. I don't know if I would consider that, like, the amount we're online or social media right now to be a major factor in that, because, you know, you can choose to post or not post, right? Yeah. Um, but I do think that, like, other people, what other people think of you is a factor that looms large in most people's decision making. How do you help people move past that? Because I, I can say, like, it's rarely been something that's held me back of what other people uh, think, but it's something that, like, at three in the morning... You know, like I'll never, I'll never avoid taking the leap. I'll always take the leap. But at three in the morning, I'll be like, oh my God, why am I thinking about what this person who I barely know who lives in like Pennsylvania thinks about this thing that I've just done and I can't stop thinking about it. So how do you help people move past those blocks? First of all, I encourage them to, to really focus on the results of the exercises, like on the things that are important to them, their list of values and what they want in the future. And every time they waver, I want to encourage them to like, I ask, like, write them down and put them on the wall somewhere and use that to avoid second guessing. Like when you think like, oh, no, what will people think? I want you to go back and think, 
you know, uh, in five years, if I don't do this, what is my life going to look like? Like I, people say that negative, (laughs) negative motivation is bad, but I don't always think that's true. And sometimes just the fact of saying to somebody like, okay, you're worried about other people's opinion. You're worried about upsetting them. Fine. I understand that. But if you don't do this thing, then a year from now, you're going to be in the exact same situation you are in now, but a year older. Like, how does that feel? That should scare you a little bit. Like that should scare you into doing the thing that you want. Um, But it's a process. And honestly, like working around other people's expectations and your fears of other people's opinion is like, that's a therapist's job. That's not necessarily my job, but I think I'm, I'm very good at encouraging people to do what they want, showing them how to get what they want and sort of like, um, boosting them up when they, when they feel doubt. I'm, 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 I have a lot of energy and enthusiasm for the decisions that we make. Totally. And, and I, I want, I'd love to support what you said there. I, I don't think negative motivation is bad at all and positive and motive motivation can be like totally toxic and like it's like you know that faux positivity and i don't want people to live in like kind of toxic negativity or toxic positivity both of them are tools it's like your left and your right hand you use one according on, on what you're doing and that fear of failure can be very helpful in stimulating a decision and taking a leap um to follow that idea around what other people think in in helping people make decisions uh, do you often come across the people uh, people struggling that the people around them, those close to them, are the people that are almost in a way hindering their ability to make a decision? Oh, totally. I mean, I would say almost all of my clients, because by the time you come to a stranger on the internet for help in making a decision, you've talked to your friends, you've talked to your family, you've talked to your partner, you've talked to whomever's around you. But the problem with those people is that they all have a tiny bit maybe a large bit of bias or self-interest in what you decide to do. And I think the service I provide is like, I have no dog in this fight. I have no investment whatsoever in what you do, except that I want the best for you. And because I can, I, you know, I'm just getting to know you in this session. I can really see so clearly what the right thing is. It's almost like rubber stamping it, like just getting a totally neutral third party perspective on, on this decision sort of checking the boxes to make sure this is not like a outlandish bonkers idea. This actually makes sense. This is good. This is like, you know, has a high chance of succeeding. That's what I offer. And I feel like, yeah, when you've, you know, family and friends and whatever, it's great to have those people's perspective, but there's a point at which you're making decisions for them rather than for yourself. Yeah, yeah, totally. Um, so you mentioned in your life this like comfort of just like making decisions, taking the leap. But you also talked about like, yeah, it didn't always work out. And sometimes like I did, I did stumble. So for you, how have you dealt with some of your life's biggest missteps? And you don't have to, surely don't share anything you don't want to share, but like how have you been able to pick yourself up and keep moving? Or maybe you didn't even stumble, but how did you recover from them? It's, you know, it's actually very hard for me to think of like a big leap I took that didn't work out, you know, maybe, I mean, I've had relationships that didn't work out or things like that. And, uh, you know, I've probably, I've done jobs that weren't that interesting, but, you know, they all helped get me to where I am now. So it's hard. I don't really look back with like big regret or, you know, really at at any of those things. Um, But one... I would say that decision-making business is really the regret minimization business. And that when people call me, like they want to make a decision that is going to allow them to not feel any regret. Um, And that, you know, that's hard, but I would also say that sort of the dirty secret of making decisions is that you can make any decision a good one if you just work hard enough at it. And that when people come to me to decide, like, should I take this job or should I move to this city or should I get a divorce or should I have a kid? Like, you can make any situation good if you, like, go about it, work really hard, you know, and, and in the right way and put the effort in, um, which I feel like is a great way to avoid looking back at those things as as mistakes. So can I push on this a little bit? So I, I'm going to tell you from my perspective, I 9 million percent agree with you. Like there's a lot of stuff that I've, I, I've spent my whole life taking huge leaps. And one of the things that I've really learned is I got to surround myself with people who 
are comfortable with me moving at my pace. It doesn't mean they have to keep up with me and or that they can't get ahead of me. It's just that like they can't criticize me or hold me back from moving at my pace. It's just the pace that I move at. And making those decisions have been has been like really, really freeing and really healthy for me. But not that long ago, I was talking about something similar to what you and I are discussing. And I was talking about like taking leaps, taking risks. And I got some pushback and I feel it was, it really gave me pause at the time. It gave me pause and I, it was a good question. And the question was, well, yeah, you know, Ram, you're like a university educated guy who grew up in like, you know, with both parents, Western Canada, you've had a lot of difficulties, but you've had a lot of opportunities. It's very easy for you to talk about taking leaps and risk taking where that, that foundation that you came from is not shared by everyone. So with that thinking, how would you, is there an application here to decision making? 100% agree on privilege and how that can make decision making easier because it seems like the perceived risks are much lower. If you have a support system, if you have parents who had money, if you had any kind of thing, if you have even a great network of friends who are there to catch you when you fall, like obviously you are making decisions from a point of privilege for sure. And that gives you a total cushion. Um, but I will say that people in general are very bad at risk assessment and that people think things are risky when they're not objectively, they are not risky. So I, the example I always use is that like someone's in a job they don't really like, they're applying for other jobs, they get an offer, they call me, should I take the offer? And I often, you know, they think like, oh my God, it's a huge risk leaving this company. What if I don't like the new job, et cetera, et cetera. Like, okay, from a realistic perspective, the worst case scenario here is not that you're going to end up on the street or that you're going to prison. It's that you end up in a job you don't like that much and you're already in that scenario, you know? But from their perspective, it's taking a huge risk to leave what they know and go to something they don't know. Um, so I would say that one of the things that I can offer them is like a realistic risk assessment and like, what's the worst that could happen? And certainly, absolutely, like for, you know, a lot of my clients and myself included, like we're operating from a position of certain privilege and that like, there's somebody there to, to catch us if we fall for sure. But I would say that that's a position that most of my clients are in. Like they're not affluent necessarily, but like they're not living on the edge. Um, and I would just say that in general, honing your risk assessment skills is like maybe the best thing you can do for your self-confidence and for your decision-making, being able to like look at the realistic possibilities in front of you, thinking about the realistic worst case scenario and making your decisions from that point of view. Like, I don't, you know, I don't think that that's privileged. I just think that that's smart. Yeah, I, I agree. So when, when I was having this conversation with this, this friend of mine who I, I was super glad pushed on me like that. Cause I was like, damn, <laughs> that's a hard thing to ask. It really got me, if anything, it's made me more convinced about the idea that risk taking, how I've built my career and how I've built my life. It's just been like, oh, of course I do that. And whatever crazy thing it is, it's like, well, of course I'm like, a, and I, I don't mean this in like a, in a um, overtly humble way. I mean this realistically, like I'm a terrible musician, a horrible musician, but I have been able to hone something that I'm good at, which is I'm quite creative and I'm really good at bringing people together. So I can write a song. I can't play it, but I can like write the basic ideas of it and I can bring together a good group of people who can have fun together, who can tour, who can put out records. In my mind, when I was a little kid growing up and I was introduced to Minor Threat, I was like, oh, these are just like kids like me who knew they weren't going to be the Rolling Stones. They're just going to put out records and like tour the, and tour. And the idea that you could just do something because you want to do it and make it happen has been the thing that I've lived my whole life by. Now I recognize that's not the reality for everyone because they've came up different ways. As an example, if my band's band broke down to like Nebraska, I'm sure I could figure out a way based on my privilege to figure it out. At the same time, I firmly believe that in, in the many different ways that people have come up, risk taking, taking leaps, like um, investing yourself, betting on yourself, betting on other people can be done as long as you make smart, calculated risks that aren't based on foolishness. And it's just that willingness to really look at things as they are and take a leap rather than always saying, that's not for me. The more you do it, the more comfortable you get at it. And just like anything, the more you do it, not only do you get more comfortable, you get better at doing it. And that's why now, as in a, you know, I'm getting close to 50 now, I can take a, a risk and be very confident it's going to work out because I have a whole lifetime of doing that. 
very the same way that you have this whole lifetime of making decisions, of course you can help people make decisions. You've gotten good at it, but you got good at it because you did it. Yeah, and I would say that people who are who are coming from a privileged background, they are not better at making decisions. They are not better at taking leaps and they are not better at taking risks. They are just as riddled with anxiety as everybody else. And they call me just as much as everybody else because like they are afraid of consequences that they have exaggerated or they're just have anxiety or for whatever reason. But I, I totally agree with you. I think that honestly, the most privileged part of my life is that I was born with a good amount of self-confidence yeah. <laughs> born and raised with it. Um, and that is like, if I could figure out a way to teach that to people, like that would be, I don't know, the, the most amazing thing ever. But like, that is the way that you can, that is really like the key to freedom and to making exciting and interesting choices is just to have like some, a, a safety net you can fall back on and be the confidence to pick yourself up and move on if things don't work out. Totally. Well, let's, let's focus on self-confidence. Cause then I also want to go into that idea of like being a bit of a hustler and having to like really self-promote. So confidence, you know, like in my, in my line of work, if I was to boil down the main thing that I think people struggle with is confidence. And we could talk about like CEOs of like multi-million dollar companies to small business owners, confidence, confidence in themselves, other people, outcomes, all of that. Um, you are someone who's really fortunate that you just have confidence. You were raised in a confident way. You're, you, you've got that. Um, what kind of feedback have you gotten around that? And I mean negative feedback, because if there's one thing that I have noticed, when people are confident and they're daring and they're bold, very often people try and stamp them out. Um, the, <laughs> so I have two younger sisters. I would say that I have like a very healthy amount of self-confidence. The middle sister has a completely delusional amount of self-confidence. <laughs> like she, like she way beyond her abilities. Really? And our youngest sister like fluctuates wildly between lots of self-confidence and like rock bottom self-confidence. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so it's like, there's many different factors that can, that can play into the, you know, the level of confidence that you have. Um, I think that there is, sorry, now I've lost track of your question because I get distracted my question, by talking my about question. my family. Well, my question would be is like when people have confidence. Oh, whether or not people stamp it out. Right. Um, I think people are mostly confused by it. Um, not because I think they don't think I should be confident, but because for so many people, it's so foreign. Like, yeah. and this breaks my heart, honestly, when I come across people who, you know, have lots of abilities and great personalities and there's so much potential there, but they just don't have the self-confidence to enact their things. And they're beset by anxiety with everything they do. And they worry about other people's opinions all the time. Like it just, it's, I don't find that they um, are trying to like shoot me down or anything. I think they're just mostly puzzled. <laughs> yeah. Um, do you ever find that people might think it's a facade and they're trying to like get underneath it or get past it? Or do you think that people are mostly like, Okay, cool. Like, this is who this person really is. Uh, I think the second one, I don't know. Yeah. I'm, I, I, I don't, maybe people are trying to undermine me and I just haven't noticed because I'm so confident. <laughs> I well don't, honestly don't know. <laughs> All right. Well, then that brings me into the space of kind of that self-promotion, being a hustler. Um, one of the things that I, people come to me a lot about uh, advice about is like, I just basically started my business one day. I was like, okay, I'm, I had worked for another coaching company that, there's a lot of stuff I could say here, but simply I could say it's like antiquated, real antiquated. And I was like, I can do something way cooler than that. And I went out and did it. So I have a lot of people talking about how do you start a business? How do you do this and do that? And I always feel that I maybe I'm not in the best position to do that because although I am always like hustling to get new contracts and to open up new things, I am also like at this point very well established in the industry. And I just have that kind of personality where it's like I'm totally confident to speak about these things. Because you work in so many different worlds and you've kind of got your, you know, your finger in a lot of different worlds, tell us about the discipline of the hustle and how to build um, an audience, how to build people who want to work with you. How have you gone about that? First of all, I would say the discipline is something that has evolved over the years, and that came with being freelance for so long. Yeah. Um, in the beginning years of being freelance or before I was freelance, like I was not nearly as self-motivated or self-disciplined as I am now. And the longer you realize that if you don't hustle now, you won't be able to pay your bills in six months, like the better you get at getting things done and getting out there. Um, and so I really credit that with you know a lot of my ability to get things done. 
also, like I said, I do a lot of different things at once. Like I'm writing articles or I'm writing a book and I'm doing the coaching and it keeps things interesting. I feel like people often get burnt out and stop being motivated when they're just working on one thing for a very long period of time. Um, and I, you know, employ a lot of productive procrastination. So like maybe I have, you know, a chapter of my book due, but I don't feel like working on it. Okay. Like I'm going to email three podcasts and see if they want to hear me talk about decision-making like, you know, and so I don't have to work on the thing that's most pressing, but I have to do something that's productive or maybe I have to exercise. Like I can exercise or I can work and I get to do whatever one I, I, you know, feel least like not doing <laughs> at yeah. the time. But, you know, I have the flexibility to do that. Like I have, um, you know, I'm, I'm self-employed. I can make my own schedule. I can work out at 11 AM. Um, you know, those, those things are all, all facilitate, uh, discipline and you know when you can control your own schedule and you don't set an alarm clock in the morning it's easier to get things done yeah well and if like if we were to bake that down to if we we're thinking about because there's a lot people come to this podcast from all sorts of different backgrounds but they all really come to hear about two things how people build businesses and run a business and also how people lead so a lot of people from like, hey, I want to do freelance or I want to start my own business. If you were to give someone just some just some very simple advice on how to get out there and self advocate, self you know self promote, what are some of the things that you'd recommend? First of all, don't overthink it. Just put up a website or start the blog or do whatever. Like, do not spend a lot of time picking out fonts or considering should I do this or do that. Like, put up the web. If you put up the website, you have a business. As a, you know, that's just, that's what I consider like to be a business. If people know that you're, if one person knows you're out there doing the thing, you're doing the thing. Tell people that you're doing it. Cold emails, like just sending emails to all your contacts, being like, guess what? I'm doing this now. Like just low hanging fruit. I am not talking about sophisticated marketing techniques or Facebook ads or anything like that. It's literally just putting up the website and then telling a bunch of people that you're doing it and then continuing to tell everybody you meet that you're doing it. And you don't have to do this full time. Like, there are so many people out there who want to start a business. They're not ready to leave their full-time job. Like, okay, take it one step at a time, put up the website, tell some people you're doing it. That's fine for a first step. It does not have to be a marketing plan. It does not have to be a five-year plan. It does not have to be sophisticated SEO strategies. Like once you have that thing out there and people know that you're doing it and you get one client, like that already builds confidence and it builds some momentum. And yeah, you just have to be consistent about reaching out and promoting yourself. But again, it's, if you can get over the feeling of the fear of rejection, I mean, the number of pitches I have sent out in my life that people have said no to like uncountable, like thousands, I'm sure thousands. Um, you know, article ideas, book ideas, podcast ideas, whatever. Like, let me be on your podcast. Let me write an article. So many no's, so many no's. And I still don't like to get rejected. Of course, I hate getting an email back that says, no, we don't want you. But, you know, if you do, if you do enough of it, if you pitch enough things that people are likely to say no to, eventually someone is going to say yes. You know, there's just no downside to putting up a website and then emailing 20... 20 blogs that you love and saying, why don't you do an interview with me? This is what I do. You know, it takes maybe two hours to send one email to those 20 people. One of them might say yes. Like just, you know, be ambitious. Don't always go for the easiest thing. Cause you know, when I got my column in the times travel section, like I had written for the times travel section a fair amount. And when I had the idea of interviewing celebrities about their carry on luggage, I originally thought like, okay, maybe I'll pitch it to like, you know, a web travel website or something like that. And I thought like, oh, well, why not start at the top? So I emailed them and they were like, yeah, sounds good. You can, <laughs> people listening to this podcast can't see me, but I'm holding up my hands in a very like, just do it sort of way. I think, I think they can see you. Can't they see you? Can't they see you? If all goes well. If all goes well, they will see you. <laughs> oh, okay, great, 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 great. <laughs> um, it, it's interesting you say that. So when I first started this podcast, um, one of the people I want to interview, I'll leave their name out of it. It was is someone that I looked up to my for much of my life, and uh, we'd had like I don't know however many episodes, and we reached out to this person, and I just I'm a firm believer of like swing for the fences right off the bat, go for it, swing for a bunch of stuff, but like don't be afraid to swing for the fences, and we got this person uh, on the phone just to talk about it, and they had 
listen to the podcast and they'd listen to one of the episodes and it, it just so happened to be an episode of someone that they didn't like, that they personally knew and they didn't like. And this person who I looked up to for most of my life, inviscerated our then podcast like uh, producer and just was like calling him names and making fun. It was horrible. And the, the person called me, like our podcast uh, person called me and was like super upset. And so we talked about it. And I got to tell you, it's one of the few times in my life where I was like, I'm no good at this. I should stop. I should give up. And I always think about this whenever I want to give up on something. Because it's like, this person, all the stuff they've done in their life that inspired me is still totally valid. And I don't think this is a good or a bad person. Maybe we caught them on a bad day. Maybe they had a really bad experience with that one person they heard on the podcast. Whatever it is. But if you let knows or bad experiences or rejections hold you back, you are just losing the essence of life. And I always think about that as saying that was such a bad experience. I very unlikely will ever have one worse than that. So why not shoot for like things that are even further than that? And I just encourage people to follow your advice here. It's like swing for the damn fences. You only get one shot at life. And if you believe in your shit, you will find other people to believe in it. And if you don't believe in it, no one's going to believe in it. Yeah, but that's so much easier said than done. You know, I, know. I just feel like I I feel like I I feel that way and I advise people in that sort of thing all the time. And, you know, especially when I'm coaching somebody and like I love to give people like a little action plan at the end of the session, especially if there's something about like, you know, quitting a job or starting a business or going freelance. Like I like to outline the steps that they should take next because I want them to get off the phone and, and know what they're doing, not to be like panicked or something like that. Um, and I definitely like when we end the call, like people are enthusiastic, they're, they're revved up, they're like ready to go. But for a lot of people, it's so hard to to swing for the fences. Like they just don't have that self-confidence. They don't have the training. I don't know what it is. And I, I honestly feel like that's something if we could teach that in schools, <laughs> um, people would be a lot better off. Cause I feel like people are so undermined by their, by their lack of confidence and their fear of rejection, or I guess it just comes down to shame. Um, that I, I don't know. I, I would love to figure out a way around that. Well, I feel like talking about it the way that we, uh, we are right now. And like, you know, I don't want to sound up too to be like, just go for it. Like having that experience, like really knocked me down. Like I was really, really upset, but I don't want to go so far as to say it was a gift. Cause like I would have preferred it didn't happen, but I, I can always go back to that and be like, Oh, like it's probably the worst projection we're ever going to have. It's the most personal. It's the most I ever felt like really bad. And if that's the worst that they can get, then I can handle a hundred notes compared to that. That's no big deal. But like, you got to be able to put yourself in that spot, that spot first to, and then have that process. And that's hard for people. But I think like having someone like you out um, talking about these things, sharing ideas, having this kind of dialogue, hopefully people can take something away from this that will give them that little bit of like whisper in the storm to say like, no, like keep going forward. Because I think the more we talk about it, the more we can inspire people to be in that space. Oh, definitely. And I, I know that I feel that way when I, you know, end a session with somebody and they're like revved up to go after the thing that they want. Like that is the best feeling in the world, not just for me, but for them. Like it really, you know, you can just change people's perspective by approaching things in, in a, in a slightly different way. Um, and that's where I feel like I, I can really help. And it's also just like so much fun to know that somebody's going to like go off and get the thing that they want. Like it just feels great. <laughs> oh yeah. I can only imagine. All right. So as we're, we're getting close to wrapping up, um, the first thing I, I'd love to hear is where can people check your stuff out? Like online, your articles, your books, anything like that. So wh where's the best place or places for people to, to look you up? Sure. Uh, if they're interested in decision-making decide and to move forward.com. And if they're interested in, you know, writing books, articles, et cetera, just myname.com. So Nell McShane Wolfhart.com. Okay, awesome. Again, everyone will have all the, those uh, links in there. And I really encourage you to check out the writing, the book, the website, because it's super, super cool and compelling stuff. All right. So as we're closing off interviews, I always ask people three scaling questions that are, that are like increasing in difficulty. Are you game? 
Uh, sure. I'm not a very fast thinker, and I have a very bad memory, but let's try. <laughs> okay. Okay. Now, th these are things that are about your world, so I, I think, I think you'll, be, you'll be happy to play with it. All right. So the first question uh, that's difficult. Uh, so you're, you've been in the business of helping people make decisions. What's one decision that you've had in your life that you agonized and struggled where you couldn't make it quick? Um, I'm actually agonizing over decision right now. And it's not like of that much import, but I'm really having a hard time with it. Um, I have been on a running streak for five years. So every day for five years, I've run one mile, um, sometimes more, but never less. Uh, almost five years. It'll be five years in January. And I'm trying to decide whether or not I should keep going or I should quit once I hit five years in January. And I mean, my, my own advice to myself would be decide and then don't decide, like make the decision and stop thinking about it. Um, but I've had been having a really hard time making up my mind as to whether or not to keep going with it. Why this one? Why is this one a difficult one? I don't know. I know I if I could figure that out, I, I, I would I would have so much money because I feel like, like I said, so many people who come and work with me, so many of my clients are people who are great at making decisions and who make, you know, hard decisions all the time. But for some reason, they come to me with just one thing. and They just can't figure it out for themselves. And so, like I said, I help them get over that hump. And for me, this particular decision, I'm like, I don't know, I'm having a really hard time making up my mind. Heck yeah. Well, I. I'm with you a little bit. I, I, I'm a runner myself and I tore my meniscus last year or this year. And uh, I'm trying to decide whether or not I give up on running entirely and just go fully into something else or if I try and do it in January. So we'll see. To be decided. Right. We All should right. keep in so, touch. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll, we'll help each other out. All right. Uh, next, next one for you. Um, how have you handled it when you've helped someone make a decision and there's a negative repercussion in their life? Mm, good question. Um, first of all, most of the people who I help make decisions, they go off into the ether and I never hear from them again. Um, and the people who come back with, they don't usually come back with like, oh, this didn't work out. They come back because they're still second guessing. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, I, at the end of every session, we have a decision. Like I make a decision for them and I tell them why and we agree on it and I give them steps to move forward. But for people who are really beset with anxiety and self-doubt and who are prone to second guessing, like they will sometimes come back to me like, I know this is the right decision, but I, I just can't make myself do it. And that is like, that is really hard for me because there, there are limited tools that I have in a, you know, one session or two sessions to, I mean, I can't change anybody's like lifelong patterns. Right. And I can't predict the future. I just, we're all just taking our best guess. So I try to reinforce, you know, the reasons we made the decision, the, how this is going to get them to what they want in the future, why this is in line with the stuff that's important to them. But beyond that, and again, this is a very small subset of people. Beyond that, there's like, there's nothing I can do short of like forcing, <laughs> forcing them to, to do the thing, which I obviously don't have control over. Um, I do sometimes give people, if they want them, give them like, deadlines and check in with them at a certain date to make sure that they've done the thing. Sometimes people find that helpful. Okay. All right. Final question. Um, and this is a, a tough one. So I'll happily like break it down, give you different questions, whatever it is, because it's quite obtuse, but I, I believe you're going to have something good here. Um, what's one piece of advice or one thing that you would suggest for people who are trying to find a greater level of consistency and balance in their personal and professional lives? I think that people tend to look at balance from the wrong perspective. I think people look at balance as something that should be part of their lives, like on an everyday basis or a weekly basis. But I encourage people to zoom back and look at balance as something that happens like over the course of many years. And, you know, there's going to be a point in your life at which it makes sense to work more so that in the future you can work less. And that balance is not, I mean, balance is great, but sometimes balance is not the thing that is going to get you the life that you want in the future. Um, and that like being consistent, consistency is also great, but like sometimes you just need to go really hard for a certain period of time so you can get like open up those options for your future self and open up your life. Um, and so people who, you know, many of my clients come to me and on their list of values, they say like work-life balance. And like sometimes work-life balance means work now, so life later. Um, and that's, that's what I would say. Like just 
big zoom out. Yeah. Uh, do you mind if I add on to that? Sure. Uh, the idea that everything's supposed to be perfect is a very like North American idea and that like all the quadrants of our life should be totally perfect and totally satisfying. And when in reality, it's like, no, like your life is going to be complex and beautiful and awesome and unbalanced and balanced. And that zoom out idea that you're talking about and understand that there are pockets of time that are going to be difficult, dreary, intense, so that you can have other periods of time that are blissful and wonderful is, I, I think it's very, very sage advice. Uh, so now as we're closing off, anything else that you want to add in? Um, just maybe one more thing that sort of links to what you're saying. Um, you know, I coach a lot of people who are afraid to make a big change in their life. And a lot of those people are in, are in a stage of their lives at which they're never going to have more freedom than they have now. You know, maybe they're in their 20s or their 30s. In the future, they want to have kids or their parents are going to be older and they're going to need to help look after them. Or there's like, you know, they have financial responsibilities to their family that is going to happen in the future. Um, and I really try to point out to them that for so many of them, the period of the greatest freedom they will ever have is the one that they're living in right now. So if there is a time to travel around the world or start your own business or, you know, climb Mount Everest, I mean, whatever, you know, I'm just pulling random examples here. Like now is probably the time. So I would encourage every listener to like look at their life and figure out like, is this decision, is this change, is this thing that I want going to be easier in a few years or like one year or five years or 10 years or is it going to be harder? And if you think it's going to be harder, maybe you should just do it right now. Hell yeah. Uh, I can speak from life experience. I was given that advice uh, and it changed everything at a pivotal moment of my of Really? My time. Yep, absolutely. So I totally love what a great way to end. Uh, so now thank you so much for making time for us today. Really appreciate it. Uh, everyone, I'll see you in the outro. And Mike, drop the beat. That was an awesome conversation. Nell, thank you so much for being on the show and for sharing your super interesting story. You know, it's an interesting thing when you think about different industries because kind of like, well not kind of, every industry is just something that didn't exist before and suddenly existed because someone said, oh hey, that thing should exist. And then one person does it, then another person does it, then another person does it. We live in such a really, confusing time. There's so much information out there. There's so many ideas out there. And in some cases, decisions we have to make have real serious consequences. I think it's so cool that Nell identified a niche and, and like a need and has filled it and done so in what I believe to be such a cool way. Also, uh, her book is an absolute must read and captures such an important time. And, and really like I, I love I love her belief in unions and the importance of making them prominent again. So really great stuff, everyone. I hope you enjoyed this episode as much as uh, I did. And until next time, my name is Aram Arslanian, and this is One Step Beyond. One step. One step.